Rabbi Rami, who is a well-known speaker not only locally but across the country, and I've just learned is in the process of writing five different books. <laughs> so that alone should instill awe in all of you, <laughs> Rabbi. <laughs> True, five books at the same time. Not, I was going to say not by choice. No, it's by choice, but it's because uh, ego run wild. <laughs> so this morning we're going to talk about Shel Silverstein's book, The Missing Piece. How many people are familiar with Shel Silverstein? How many people know him because of The Giving Tree? How many people hate The Giving Tree? <laughs> I hate oh, Playboy magazine, you know. And that's why you bought the magazine, was just for the cartoons. Because <laughs> remember, the Shel Silverstein things didn't go like this. <laughs> yeah, I hate The Giving Tree. I hate The Giving Tree. So we're not talking about The Giving Tree, but uh, I'll tell you while I hate it. It's this story about, you know, just th this enabling tree who happens to be a woman, which makes it all the worse, and this incredibly consumerist, narcissistic little guy who grows up to be a narcissistic old man who just takes and takes and takes and takes from this tree. And at some point, she should have just smacked him with a branch and said, really, get a job and go buy a boat. Don't cut me up for your stupid boat. You know what I mean? She's always giving. And then in the end, she's just a stump, and he's still just depressed. I don't like the book. According to Shel Silverstein himself, he wrote it not to promote the very things that I hate about the book, but to raise these questions. So I don't know if that's true or not, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt. His book, The Missing Piece, however, is one of the most brilliant pieces of spiritual literature of the 20th century. <laughs> if I'm going to speak in hyperbole, let me, let me just go with that. Uh, how many people have read the book? Most people haven't, right? Just a couple of people. It's not one of his better known books. So I'm going to describe it to you, and then I urge you to go get a copy. The Missing Piece is about a Pac-Man-shaped character. So remember, Pac-Man's are like a, oh, yeah. a circle with a pie piece missing. So a Pac-Man shaped character who's looking for that little pie slice that's missing. And you don't know if it's male or female, but this, this Pac-Man character rolls around, and because she is missing this piece, she rolls very bumpily. Right? So it's everything is smooth and then plonk, and then and then smooth and plonk. And this keeps her from rolling very quickly. So she rolls very slowly, and it gives her time to talk to the worm that goes by for the butterfly to light on her, and they have a conversation to smell the roses kind of thing. And while she's rolling around, she's singing to herself this song, looking for my missing piece and looking for my missing piece, over and over and over again. And that seems to be what consumes her life, this quest for wholeness to make her circle complete. At one point during the story, she tries, I mean, she, she continually tries to fit different things into this slice that, that's missing. So, you know, it's a pie slice. Sometimes she comes up with something round, it doesn't fit. Something square doesn't fit. Sometimes it's too small and it falls out. Sometimes it's too big, she can't move it all, and she has to spit it out. Nothing that she comes across helps her at all. So she continues to roll around with this clunking motion, continuing to, com commune with the world around her, and continuing to sing this song, looking for my missing piece. Eventually, she finds what's missing, and she's complete. She's whole. But because she's whole, she no longer has that stumbling way of going through the world. She now rolls smoothly, so smoothly that she has no time to talk to the worm. And no, she's going much too fast for the butterfly to light on her, and she zips by the flowers way faster than uh, she, she can smell them. She's now complete, whole, perfect, and out of touch with her reality. <laughs> and then she realizes it. And when she does, she spits the piece out. <laughs> now she's back to being imperfect and broken again. Now her way in the world is this smooth clunk, smooth clunk, stuttering through her life. 
and she still sings her song, Looking for My Missing Piece, but she's no longer looking for her missing piece. She's found it, rejected it, and just moves on. And that's how the book works. That's, that's the whole story. And it's just done with very simple line drawings that he does, and it's a very attractive little book. And it, it's easily read in, in five, six minutes. The meaning of it, though, is really powerful. What we're talking about is what's sometimes called the spirituality of imperfection. Right? Imperfection. So many of us who are you know, on a so-called spiritual quest are looking for completeness, for wholeness, for perfection, without realizing that the true wholeness has to include imperfection. So I'm a non-dualist. Right, Non-dualists are people who think there's only one uh, sort of one substance to reality, and it's everything that exists is a part of that. So the Hindus uh, have a, a metaphor for this: that think of the universe as uh, an ocean, and every bit of the universe as a wave of that ocean. So while no wave is the entirety of the ocean, every wave uh, is simply the ocean in extension. So you can say. The wave is the ocean, even though you can't say exactly. I'm sorry, the, the ocean is a wave, even though you can't say exactly the wave is the ocean. Right? You follow that? Mm -hmm. So in, in Hindu talk, of course, the wave is what they call Brahman, the, the <coughs> godlike reality. And, and the, the expressions of that are um, called Atman. And that's each of our ourselves. But ultimately, Atman is Brahman, Brahman is Atman. It's all, it's all one system. So, the non-dualist understands that to be true. Now, you may accept that or reject that, but the non-dualist understands that to be true and tries to avoid pitting one thing against the other as, an, as, as opposites, good and bad, up and down, in and out. We recognize that all of those things are totally interrelated, <coughs> that you can't have up without down, in without out, good without bad. There's a game that Alan Watts used to talk about called the dictionary game. And the, 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 the game was, how many different words did you have to look up when you're looking up the word good before you ended up with simply not bad? Or how many more times did you have to look up the word bad before you simply ended up with not good? And he said, this is true for all, all kinds of words, because all of these things really go together. But in the spiritual world, we tend to make this division into a dualistic stance, where there's good and all good, and then there's bad and all that, and the two don't meet. And in the religious world, I'm making a slight distinction between spiritual and religious, religious being the more organized of the spiritual dimensions, uh, spiritual conversations, that in the religious dimension, you then identify God with the all good, and then have to come up with something else for the all bad. And once you make that kind of split, everything goes to hell. <laughs> Everything is just gets screwed. So you know, in, in the Judeo-Christian Islamic world, more more Ju more Christianity and Islam than Judaism because we don't have this hard fast theology. But still, you have this notion that God is good, and if bad stuff happens, it can't be God, right? Because God is good, so God can't do bad things. Uh, there's a whole debate. I mean, it's been going on for centuries, but we're still having this debate over you know. Which is interesting. I, I, I'm teaching Friday night at, in Swanee also, but at St. Mary's, and I won't be able to go to the lecture at four. But I'm interested, you know, in, in when, when you have these conversations between believers and non-believers, or I would rather say people who simply believe differently, uh, about goodness and morality. A lot of people in this country, I mean, vast majority of people in this country, believe that you can't know what's good if you don't have God telling you. But if you've ever read any of his books, God's, I mean, you realize God thinks a lot of things that are really awful are really cool. <laughs> Noah starts this week. I don't know if anyone's going to go see the, the, the movie Noah. But Noah is the story of a genocidal God who wipes out everything, you know, except, except uh, one alcoholic and his family, and, <laughs> and then starts to create the human race all over again from this God. I mean, it's sort of nuts, you know, and God's upset because people are, are wicked, so he wipes us all out. 
when he gets to the Abraham story, God wants to do the same thing with Sodom and Gomorrah, but this time Abraham stands up and says, what are you, nuts? And he talks God out of it, at least theoretically tries to talk God out of it. But if you look to the Bible to find out what's good, you find that slavery is good, and uh, uh, genocide is good, and all, incest. incest is good, and all, and all kinds of, of things that you and I would consider you know, horrible to be good because God sanctions them. When I was teaching Bible at MTSU, Middle Tennessee State, this stuff would always come up, and, and the incest thing would come up. <clears throat> and, and I would ask my students, you know, what do you think God is sanctioning this? And they would always have some pseudo-scientific answer. Well, back then, the gene pool was so pure that it didn't matter if, you know, <laughs> if Adam and Eve's kids were having sex with their moms and they could make more people. Because <laughs> the genes were so... I, I mean, it's, it's so crazy what we can do with these texts. But anyway... That's what happens when you have an all-good, all-just God, and you try to explain what's evil. So you either, you either create a devil and then excuse God from everything. We have lots of ways of doing that. That was just one of them. Or we say it's a mystery. I have lots of friends in Murfreesboro who say, well, God works in mysterious ways. But that's just a way of covering the fact that crap happens. <laughs> I forgot we're being videotaped here. <laughs> I we don't said, care. I, I almost said shit happens. <laughs> so, <laughs> by saying God's a mystery or, or you know, God works in mysterious ways, it's just a confession. It's just a way of avoiding the, the reality. What non-dualists know is that good and evil go together and there's no way to separate them out. And you have to accept if you're going to accept one, you're going to accept the other. It's just part of the system. And if you want to throw the word God into it, then you have to simply say that God is that which manifests as both good and evil. It's just the nature of, of reality. And if you want to say there's a God, then God is reality. And you're stuck with that, that non-dualist position. In the, giving, in the uh, missing piece, they come, I, I think this is the position he's trying to come to in a much more elegant way what I'm saying. Because what the Pac-Man character realizes is that imperfection is not our problem. Evil is not our problem. It's just part of the system. That it's our imperfection that, when used properly, allows us to integrate, to, to interact with one another. It's our imperfections, our, our um, brokenness, that allows us to relate to one another. Because it's our imperfections and our brokenness that slow us down and keep us from that obnoxious, it's just it's a minor way of saying it, that, that obnoxious sense of, of smugness that people get when they think they're okay, whole. There's no such thing as being whole that does not include the broken. That's the message of the missing piece. That's the message of the spirituality of imperfection. You look at the brokenness in your life, and if you try to shun it, Shel Silverstein, I, I would argue, and, and I personally would argue, you're making a terrible mistake. You, you have to embrace the brokenness as part of a greater wholeness. So Jesus says in the Gospel, be perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect. Okay, there's a, a setup for failure, <laughs> if there ever was one. The, the, it's, it's simply Jesus' way of saying what's said in Leviticus, uh, be holy, as God says this in Leviticus, be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. I mean, these kinds of challenges are really insane unless they're not saying what they seem to be saying. So how can I be holy the way God is holy? How can I be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect? If we take holiness and perfection to be opposites, of brokenness and imperfection, then it can't be done. It's just impossible. It's not the way there's there's it's not the way the universe is constructed. If we realize that perfection includes imperfection, that the holy includes the unholy, that what we're really talking about is being complete, meaning that we recognize all these opposites as part of ourselves. Uh, that by that only by being complete do we achieve. The, the spiritual heights that humans can, can achieve, then I think both the, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament 
are telling us something quite profound, as is Shel Silverstein. The end of the story, the Pac-Man character doesn't stop looking for the missing piece. But now she does it ironically. Now she does it knowing that she's got it and rejected it, and realizes that's what, what's missing isn't an actual piece, but simply the awareness that she's whole just the way she is. So she's no longer looking for something to fill that void in her life. She's just reminding herself, it becomes her mantra, reminding herself that, that there's already, that the, what's missing is actually, I don't know how you say it, in, 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 I don't know how you actually put this, but what's missing is actually not missing. The missing is the thing. Does that make sense? Right? So, so it's the pie that slice that's missing is still a pie slice. It's the pie slice in abstentia. But it's still part of the wholeness that is her. So as I read the text, both the, the Bible and, and Shel Silverstein, what I get out of this is, can I realize that the brokenness in my life is part of my whole process? That it's not something I need to fix even. I mean, to the extent it causes people hurt, I mean, I, I need to fix that. But if it's not something that I want to get rid of, that I need to be perfect in the way, in that sense of not being broken in any, in any way. I, that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is the realization that my brokenness is part of my existence. And that the suffering that I experience from this is simply <coughs> part of the reality. And it's to be embraced, to be welcomed, uh, celebrated as well as the other parts, so that you get that as she's rolling around and everything is smooth and then clunk and everything is smooth and then clunk, that clunk is no more a problem to her than the smoothness was. That's the ultimate goal. In Buddhism, the Buddha uses the same metaphor, but he uses a wheel instead of a Pac-Man. And he says the wheel is broken and every time the chariot runs over that broken wheel there's a clunk and he calls that suffering. And he thinks that we can end suffering and you can end suffering by ending desire. And I know lots of Buddhists who are trying to end desire in a way that will fix the wheel so it's, it's round. Mm -hmm. But when I was in the world of Zen Buddhism, my Zen master said, no, the desire you have to end is the desire to fix the stupid wheel. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, no, everything is clunk, fine. Everything is clunk, fine. Because that's the way it is. <laughs> and that you can embrace the brokenness as part of the greater wholeness of the thing. <laughs> so I would recommend reading Shel Silverstein. I'm watching the clock, so my, my time of seeing you getting ready to jump up to. No? Oh, no. My leg fell asleep. Your leg fell asleep. <laughs> 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 Hopefully that was the only part of the congregation that fell asleep. <laughs> so what I want to do is I want to expand this later when we do when we do the second hour. But I think what he's talking about is something that's really, really crucial to our own spiritual development especially, and this is the last point, especially outside traditional religious frame. So one of the things I love about Unitarian Universalist is, at least the experiences I've had going to the, the various churches that I go to, is there isn't an attempt to fix anything. I mean, as individuals, we all have this psychological inclination. But as a religion, Unitarianism doesn't say, OK, there's good over here. And, and bad over here. And there's God is on this side and the devil's on the other. We don't make that kind of split. We sort of say there's reality and we can help each other get through it. And I find that acceptance of reality, including the brokenness, to be not only refreshing intellectually, which I think it is, but also compelling spiritually. That unit, you use R, or Unitarian Universalism, is a spirituality of imperfection. And it allows us to embrace individuals whom others would shun because they're broken in a way that, that they shouldn't be. In other words, oh, you know you should be whole like, or perfect like your father in heaven is perfect. That, that we don't shun, or you, you use don't shun those who are broken, but rather embrace them as fellow travelers because the road is one of brokenness. That should be a, 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 a motor, I don't know, it's motivator, that should be, I don't want to go into pride, because that, that's not the direction I want to go, but that should be an affirmation of why uh, philosophies like Unitarian Universalism are so important, because they don't try to change reality, they simply try to embrace reality, and in embracing reality, 
have compassion on everyone who is, as we all are, broken. My Baptist friend in moved from Murfreesboro to, 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 to uh, Chattanooga. No, Knoxville. My Baptist friend in Knoxville thinks this is totally wrong. That Jesus will make you whole. Uh, but I think, I think he's on, I, I think Jesus would disagree, but that's always easy to do because Jesus is dead. Uh, <laughs> so you can make Jesus say whatever you want. Uh, but, I, but I think he's absolutely wrong. And I think that the religion he teaches as, as a Baptist, is missing the deepest human spiritual challenge that actual people really face. And that when you go into that dualistic world and you're not fixed, then you're feeling even more broken. But when you go into the non-dualistic uh, world of, of uh, or, or this, this kind of philosophy within a UU environment, you're simply welcomed with your brokenness. And there's no need to fix. There's just a need to walk alongside, to, to, to comfort, to be with people in their, in their brokenness. And that allows for a kind of healing that I think the little Pac-Man character finds in the end, where she realizes brokenness is part of her life. It's actually a good part of her life. It allows her to inter interact with the rest of the world. And she can go and sing her song about looking for her missing piece, but she knows that's really not what she's doing. She's looking for the next worm to talk to and the next butterfly to commute. So I'm going to stop with that, and we'll see where that takes us during talkback. And thank you very much for sharing with me this morning.